Welcome back, everyone. Stories for this week is sponsored by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training certification and research. You can visit SANS.org to learn more. Be sure to check out our featured training event for this show, which is SANS Pen Test Austin. This comes from the SANS Pen Test curriculum. And what is so special about SANS Pen Test Austin? Because it's awesome. Because Larry's going to be there teaching SAN Security 617. Wa- oh, get, me, get the title right for me, Larry. Wire, wireless, wireless Ethical Hacking and Defense. Wireless Ethical Hacking and Defense. We talk about not just 802.11 hacking, but right. all kinds of wireless yep. hacking now, which is great. Yep. Uh, Zigbee, we, uh, we touch on Bluetooth. Z-Wave, Bluetooth a lot. Um, some uh, software-defined radio type of things. Nice. Um, we, we're, the, the course has just got a, a pretty decent update at... Uh, happening in Orlando, um, so like a week from now, la- yep. less than a week from now, um, and we'll also be in in Austin as well. Yep. So be all the the <coughs> entire pen testing curriculum will be there. Uh, Net wars will yep. be happening. Uh, enjoy three exciting nights of Net wars challenges. Yep. Three huge nights of Net wars, no less. Coin a palooza. Yes. Earn up the four additional Sands pen test challenge coins um, with each with an inter. Integrated cipher challenge, yep. which is really cool. I think Ed talked about that on the yeah, show absolutely. when he came on, I think, yep. last year. So, so basically, and basically, Coinapalooza, when you participate in Net Wars, if you have participated in one of the classes bef- mm-hmm. prior and you make it to a certain point in Net Wars, one of those three nights, I don't know which night, mm-hmm. any of those three nights or one of the nights that they're doing it, um, you are eligible to receive the coin for that class um, because we know that it can be very difficult to win a coin at one of those events and your skills might be there and but so we want to give folks another opportunity to get those very coveted coins because they're they're actually pretty awesome there'll be cyber city missions happening at the event and a lock picking event as well yeah which is actually kind of a big deal for sans is it that is. they've never hosted a lock picking event wow uh, and they've got a cu- couple of uh, austin locals coming out to do some lock picking demonstrations and and some of those types of things during one of the evening events and uh it's actually going to be pretty cool so i got to remember to bring my lock picks so that you know get some practice while we're there and uh quite honestly i've never gotten a chance to do any of the cyber city stuff and uh I want to go check out Cyber Cyber City and blow some stuff up. I guess. Dude, you're making me want to come down to Austin. Oh, you should totally should. You totally should. That's good. That was the no, whole point of that yeah, segment, yeah. actually. Not to mention, I'll be teaching the wireless class there. And you know what? I have never been to Austin before, and I hear are it's you, a really great. Are you bringing a nanny cam with you? Because that would seal the deal. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I can because I was actually just looking at them on Amazon. Um, I, I'm excited about going to Austin because one, I hear there's great freaking barbecue, and I asked folks on Twitter and Facebook. Austin's and, good too. And, and you know what? I think I'm going to get f- even huger than I am now because I think I'm going to eat barbecue <laughs> every night that I'm there because there's so many places to try, uh, along with beer. So if you've got any other beer recommendations and barbecue recommendations, Jester um, King, you got to do Jester King. Ch- Jester King or Chester King? Jester. Jester. Jay. Okay, I think that was one of the recommendations that I received. So this will this will be interesting. So I'm excited to go to Austin. Um, so this will be this will be fun, mostly because of beer and barbecue and my class. So cool. All right, let's go talk about some stories, Paul. Yeah, so I was just reading one on uh, someone had put in my show notes about vulnerable routers uh, issued by ISPs are vulnerable. That's to, the one I was just reading too. Yeah, vulnerable to mm, barbecue. Um, uh, password disclosure. So basically, there is a authentication bypass vulnerability. Wait, wait, I would wait. Call it. Let me back up here. There was a story in your show notes that someone put in for you. Yes. Yes. How how do I get one of these magical interns? Well, sometimes <laughs> they send them to the email list. This too. is true. This is true, Frank. Yeah. Frank's Frank's awesome yeah, Frank kind of tailors it to, to each one of us. But there's a, a directory traversal flaw that I assume can be accessed without, a, it says unauthenticated. So this yeah. to me is both a uh, double vulnerability. So it is a um, authentication bypass vulnerability coupled with a directory traversal flaw that allows attackers to pull the configuration file, which usually like config.xml, which contains password hashes that can be easily broken, allowing attackers remote access to over 700,000 ADSL routers. Um, and uh, memory dumps have been analyzed, and most of the IP addresses are from China, so we <laughs> cover, covered that. Whoops, I mean, uh, yep. roll the attribution dice. Yep. 
so there's uh yeah you know that this is bad this is what cisco we've been... asas were vulnerable to the same thing yeah something very similar it's interesting how uh authentication bypass and directory traversal attacks are common we should probably take note of that nick i'm just saying I'm not ready to release what we're working on but <laughs> yes that's all i'll say in any case uh, I don't have much else to say on that just yet. Well, let me. But here's the way I look at it, though. Right? Uh, all the, all the serious things that you talked about, I fully accept. Seven hundred thousand routers, ADSL. So what kind of speeds are we talking about here? Because that's not going to be fantastic, and, and the upstream on those is not going to be fantastic either. And seven hundred thousand out of how many million of routers that exist? So, so where I think something like this is interesting is, is it's just another sign to say, hey, folks, if you're having someone design hardware for you or software for you, please test it. There's a set of basic things to take a look at. Uh, if you're if you're one of these uh, cable companies or, or one of these other uh, providers that's distributing these things, then then you know there's some basic checking that's I don't feel is terribly hard to do uh, to take a look at it. But like this one in particular, I mean you know I don't feel like my hair is on fire over it. Now, am I misreading it? I, I think you are. Uh, and just to clarify, you're you're looking at it as how can I use this compromised router to let's say do a DDoS or you said it's a bot to do something else. There was a, a case in Mexico yeah, a couple of years, years ago several. that what happened was that they were able to go into all of the routers, they changed the DNS settings for the, uh, uh, okay. and what they did is they redirected the major banks that were in the federal district of, of Mexico City, got redirected to a fake site, and they were able to steal credentials for the accounts, and then they did the redirection in the upstream back to the proper bank after okay. showing all of those credentials. Okay. All right. So, it so and, and that's the kind of thing you can automate. So automating that across 700,000 routers that are probably fairly easy to find crawling and, the internet. And that's now, just, now it's a different problem. And that's just one particular firmware that happened to be running across different model routers. These types of flaws exist on another model router that gives you maybe another 400,000 and then you find one that gives you another few hundred thousand and you just keep doing it, you know, rinse, repeat kind of thing. So is the solution, is there a, a backbone level solution? Um, other than producing routers that are secure, no. And r right I mean, now many of these telcos can actually go in and modify these routers. Many of the routers yes. that okay. the telcos actually give, they can go in, modify, reboot them, change settings, log into them. Because I had to troubleshoot that with my telco. And what actually surprised me was that when I was talking with my neighbor, uh, she told me that she was going through the same thing with her ISP. And I told her, have you ever gone to your router and modified stuff? She says, yes, they actually gave me the password. Oh, cool. Uh, and, did, and was did you write it down? From them. And she told me, oh, it's easy. It's admin and password, password. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. like, and that's standard for all of their routers and yeah. that's like yeah the uh, tech the tech person over support told me that that's the standard password for all of them that they give out for the adsl connection and i'm like damn yep they Come. make it so easy <laughs> it's too easy larry what do you got for stories what do i got for stories sorry i was got distracted by this wireless video camera thing here that was kind of interesting because it you can view the stuff via skype Remotely. Interesting. Oh, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. Um, one of, sorry, let me get back to the show notes here. Sure. Um, so one of the stories I had in here was actually kind of, uh, kind of, I would have been frightened my, by my, frightened, had my ass frightened off. Um, my story number one, which was uh, drug pump flaws. So uh, Billy Rios. Yep. Um, Went and bought a bunch of these uh, um, drug pumps, um, intravenous drug pumps off of eBay yep. and was IV doing pumps, some yeah. yeah IV pumps and was doing some research on them. Um, found out that there's one particular um, model that allows um, authentication bypass 
um, and found that you could modify the drug database information because it was all set in plain text, unauthenticated. So you could like man in the middle it and then mm. change the dosing information from this remote source so that now you're potentially being dispensed more medication that you should get. And well, depending on the medication, it could kill you. And several weeks after having this happen, he found himself in a life-threatening situation um, and needing emergency surgery and waking up in the hospital, finding himself connected to one of these very devices. Oh, interesting. I didn't read that. Yeah, yeah. So right right from the, uh, the mm -hmm. beginning, when Billy Rios needed emergency surgery last summer after cerebral spinal fluid began leaking through his nose, he was only partly focused on his life-threatening condition. That's because Rios was distracted by the computerized drug infusion pump Stanford Medical Center used to administer medication <laughs> to him and other patients. As a, secu as a security researcher, Rios realized he'd purchased the same model of pumps months earlier on eBay to examine them for security flaws. And mm. what was the security flaw that gave him access? I believe you said it was... Um, doesn't use auth authentication for their internal drug libraries. Yeah, authentication bypass. Uh, I believe authentication bypass okay. was something. And what was that. the D-Link and other firmware? Uh, no, I'm flaw? sorry. Was it, was, it was not authentication bypass. It was that uh, there was no authentication for the information that was sent or dispensation dosages. Uh, for the boundaries. And for the boundaries, yes. So the communication from the device to... To another source was... To another source. Not. Which um, was, that was pointed out in the Veracode report, by the yep. way. Um, on and our, consumer and level I devices. I do want to say also that um, there were... Um, Uh, let's see, could install malware on them, so <laughs> unauthorized drug libraries. System also stores usernames and passwords in plain text yep. um, and have default passwords in firmware, if I remember correctly. Yes. So yep. uh, based on Billy's research and others, I surmised uh, in my, my talk that I give on embedded systems, which yep. I hope to be done with talking about the topic, but clearly we haven't no, made any... You are not done. No, we haven't made any head... Because we haven't fixed no. the problem, right? Uh, it, and and I, uh, I hate to say it, but IoT is making this go like this. Yeah. I mean, well, and here's the thing. The flaws that you described on a uh, drug uh, intravenous pump are the same flaws that we find in consumer-level yeah. devices such mm -hmm. as cameras, mm -hmm. smart thing, not necessarily smart things specifically, but other home automation right. systems that Verico disclosed and home routers that we talked about in the previous story. Yep. That's the concerning thing for me. People you know what that, like, you know, so here's the optimism then. Uh, you know, forgive me for sounding a little bit uh, Pollyannish about this, but that means then that if we can start to engender better customer requirements at the B2B level, it should start to influence the consumer level. Right. We know mm. what the problems are, and they're consistent across industries, Mike. So we should be able to fix them in all industries by making a lot of these changes and get the majority of them that they have in common. So it's sure. almost a good thing yeah, that and, they have and, them in common, right? Yeah, and, and so here's uh, – yeah, I mean, w and I, I love the fact that you're breaking down and saying, okay, but we're seeing that again, but we're seeing that again, because that's really helping people calibrate that to say – because, you know, again, this is one of those stories where you're looking at it going, whoa, that's crazy. Yeah, it is. Um Okay, so let's go, right? I like the way you're breaking it down. But but so here's the thing then. Client requirement is is this general concept that I don't think we utilize very effectively in the security space. And it basically says, hi, I'm the client. I have these requirements. But, you know, like I'm, I'm looking at this one part that I think is actually kind of interesting, especially to, well, okay, it's on Wired. So I guess it explains why they're, they're being more technical. Um, but I'll, I'll read from it real quick because it says the Hospera pumps do use validation IDs that are embedded in the header of a drug library updates and in the libraries themselves to help ensure that data in a library hasn't been corrupted or altered in transit, which is similar to a checksum, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, and, and then it says that it has a different ID, but it doesn't determine if it's legitimate or not. So it, it's right, and we know you can corrupt the checksum, that's fine. So what they're saying is they're not signing it, they're not, they're not using a variety of other controls that we have. But what that tells me though, is that if somebody asks this question, up front, well, wait a minute, what if somebody changes the drug libraries? They had an answer. And they had an answer to a lot of people that sounds actually pretty convincing. We, we, we do header uh, validation, we use these different IDs, every library has a different ID, we make sure none of the data was corrupted. I mean, that sounds great, unless you kind of dig into it a little bit better. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, what I'm, 
what I'm listening to then as, as we keep having these conversations is we've got to get better at either requiring some testing, looking at what was tested, or when somebody says that to us, go, that's awesome. Wait, explain to me again how that works. It, and like actually have them step you through it and say, but that's just a checksum, right? So I, I could make my own. Yep. And have them go, well, no one would do that. And you go, well, yeah, yeah. hopefully. The VIP but, attack. Yeah. I yep. just so it, I, I, so I have, but, you know, I, again, I have I have a slight objection. I, slight, I don't think okay. Mike, uh, Mr. Santar Colangelo, should ever be able to go Pollyanna on us again because he doesn't have the hair for it. I know. I should get a wig. <laughs> I, I will. I'll get a wig. I'll I'll get a wig with the with the big braids and everything else. Yeah. I just you know again like what, I I love these conversations and so I just always look at it and say. Okay, so what's the solution? But what's interesting is that we're seeing so many of the same trends. So the solution for us is we've got to start asking vendors for this stuff. By the way, um, I, you know, I, 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 this has come to me recently. There's what we'd like to have and there's what we have. So I think we probably, we probably have to pursue this on two tracks. Here's what we'd like to have from the requirements. But at the end of the day, the hospital says, hey, we need this. This is what's going to work, et cetera. Somebody's going to make the decision. That's fine. But then we need to, to say, because right, here's the second part in my head, procedural, and this is, this is really old school. We need to be able to say to people, hey, by the way, make, make sure you're double checking that. Like the manual stuff that you used to have to do because you didn't have a machine behind you, don't, don't stop. I, I remember I helped the police department put um, their mobile data terminals in, I don't know, 15 years ago. The guy who complained about it the most, uh, absolutely didn't want them, didn't want anything to do with them, couldn't do it, is the guy that when they went down, he complained the loudest. But the chief always laughed. He's like, he doesn't write any tickets. Like when the computer's down, he doesn't do anything. Like, you know, and, and the point is these machines are designed to help people, but they shouldn't replace uh, human judgment and, and the decision making that, that we have capable to us. So part of our job then is to say to people, this is great. These are great checks and balances. There may be something that someone can do. We'd like you to stay alert, right? And, and engage, the, you know, our, our professionals in those conversations so that, by the way, if they see flaws or problems, they can tell us. Imagine if, if one of the nurses or one of the doctors comes to you and says, hey, I, I noticed I could uh, screw around and do X. Does that concern you guys? Hell yes, it does. Uh, and then, you know, we can go take that to the, uh, to the vendors. And we should talk about something a little more positive like WordPress vulnerabilities. <laughs> 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 the FBI has warned us that WordPress has vulnerabilities that are going to be exploited by ISIS. That's oh, my saying. goodness. For the children, right? It's terrorists for children. That's oh, right. wait, we covered both on this. We we're worried about the children with the nanny cams. And now, and now ISIS. And so we're, we're full circle tonight. We're full circle. <laughs> How can we loop nanny cams? We've got China. We got Russia. Did we get Russia? We got I think, Russia. I think we mentioned, we mentioned, yeah, we mentioned, we mentioned Russia. Russia. Yeah. yeah. WP Supercache has vulnerabilities as well, which is a very popular WordPress plugin. Yeah. Larry's solution is to just run WordPress with no plugins. Which isn't a very viable solution for a lot of If you of want folks. to do stuff that requires a plugin, it kind of limits you. Yeah, but for, for me on my blog. If you can get away with it, I, sure. I, I, don't, I don't need no plugins. I don't need any ideas. You can audit the or... code of all the plugins you install, but that's not feasible either. Well, because clearly auditing of open source code happens quite regularly. This is true. Like open SSL and... Oh, wait. The problem, is there's, the problem is there's so many plugins and they're unvalidated. Yep, because anybody can write a plugin. Yep. I can write a plugin and you know it'll be terribly secure. Exactly. Sorry, I just have to drink because I really have no solutions to that problem. <laughs> yeah, don't run. Yeah, you know, I'm sitting here thinking I, I don't have one either. Oh, except for, you WordPress. know, again, <laughs> this is where we go back to the cloud. I mean, there are hosting companies that they stay on top of this and they pay attention to it. And by the way, they may, uh, let's not say ban, they may heavily discourage the use of certain plugins or otherwise say, hey, we, we've looked at these and, and they can take precautions to it. Do you get that on your standard $7 a month hosting? I don't know, sometimes, not always. But I mean, you know, again, this is one of those things where the, few people are going to be spinning up their own servers on their ADSL modem at home uh, and running WordPress on it. Few. I'm not saying it's not possible, but you know, I mean, well, if Hillary Clinton can run her own email server, you know, I mean, <laughs> right. it's, it's, this is true, Kevin. This uh, is true. You know what, though? You never she know these days. The and he gave us the internet, so they they got they got the connection. We're good. Wow. <laughs>
Paul, well, you know, actually, I want, if it's okay, I'd love you guys, uh, your take on that, that pen testing, you're doing it wrong, part one. Yeah, we talked about this subject a lot. Yeah, and you know what? I, I thought this, I, I thought it was a good article, and quite honestly, I started to read it a little bit. This comes from Pen Testicles. Pen Testicles. Do we have the Testicle Sweeper? Pen, pen Testicles blog. Yep. We interviewed Test- the- Testicles. Yes. Yep. Pen and, tes- and, Testicles. And, and, and quite My on- testicles are very warm. Yes, and the pen testicles blog is hot right now. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> yeah, my testicles are really warm. <laughs> and quite honestly, I got into starting to read some of this article, and I get down to, I get down in there, and I start looking, and so I, I saw twenty-seven thousand one, and uh, OS top ten. Uh, well, OS top ten, not too bad, but CTM and CTL and CESG check. And I went it it's all BFD C- C- Crest Star and Seabest, and I went, huh? What? What are these things? Um, so, but that that may be just me, my ignorance and stuff. Um, the key for me is that well, the that beginning was of the gonna, paragraph, was... cogitation, cogitation, big mm. words. It is a big word. That's. I was going to ask you guys on, on the definition of traditional pen testing because the oddity is, uh, I wasn't. I wasn't sure I completely liked it as a, as a, I don't dislike it. I don't have anything better. That's why I was asking. Cause I, I'm not really against the conclusion in that right. we need to be better at understanding our scope and what we're asking for and what we're getting and what we can do with it. And obviously, you know, Paul, we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks, but yeah, this covered a lot of ground and that's why I was kind of curious. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, uh, Michael, I think I might also add uh, to that, you know, what the customer really wants. They say they want a pen test, but what does that what really does that mean? mean? Do they yeah. want us to plug into a port in their conference room, or do they want some scenario-based test, or do they want us to... Well, let me take that a step deeper, because a lot of times there's there's what people say they want, and there's what they need, right? Yeah. And, 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 it, mm. and, and I, it's a slight difference on what you said, right? So you say they say pen test, and you go, I hear you say pen test. I'm not sure if that means what you think it means. What are you trying to solve? But do you guys, when you're pen testing, do you ever say to somebody, you know what, guys, look, I'm going to blow holes in all that stuff. This isn't what you need right now. Uh, let's go look at this instead. Or like, yes. do you? Yeah, okay. absolutely. That's why I'm, I don't know if it's somewhat controversial, but I'm not a huge fan of defining and putting a pen test in like a, a square box. Mm-hmm. This is this is what a pen test you, is. You have to have, some, pen you te- have to have some Don't the attackers obey those rules? I mean, if you say to an attacker, look, you can only attack me uh, in this this particular window on these machines, they they listen to that, no? Well, yeah, that's why I'm saying there shouldn't, it shouldn't be a box that you <laughs> put pen testing in. It should be something that is constructed each time it occurs with an organization with yeah, like you said, there are some rules. You know, sure. there, ha- there has to be some rules, but it should sure. be fairly open ended. We shouldn't say, you know what, this is a pen test. We should say that there are components that pen tests can mm-hmm. include, and I think the p test standard does that very well. They yep. hit, hit all the components, and you kind of pick and choose those components and tune those components for your environment. I think every pen test is, is different. Is different, and yep. you can. I mean, right? Absolutely. Every every, every customer different. requirement is different. Every end result that they want is different. Um, every test environment is different. Uh, and, and you were saying that you know one yeah. of those constraints. My favorite thing when someone comes and does it, uh, wants us to do a pen test and said, "Well, you can only test after hours." I'm like, and Tom <laughs> Tom, Tom Liston <laughs> says this perfectly. He says, "Well, do you have that agreement with the rest of the internet?" Is that yeah. The, yeah, exactly. the attackers can only break into your stuff after hours? And the answer is n- no. So, well, but so again, guess, uh, I mean, as pen testers, we're typically given a shorter window of time than the rest of the internet has. So we take certain liberties to shorten the hmm? the test, right? We Absolutely. use some automated tools that yeah, attackers probably wouldn't use because they're really noisy, right? I mean, we may do that at different stages during the test, but. Sure. We take certain liberties to squash that test down into a week or two or a month, whereas the rest of the internet has all the time in the world to be really stealthy and take their time with it. Yep, absolutely. Months, years. Yeah. Weeks. So, I mean, that's sometimes why I think you're somewhat limited to off hours because you may be doing some more intensive or intrusive tests that are noisy. Uh, having said that, I think one of the goals of a penetration test should be how quickly or not so quickly do you detect that these attacks or potential attacks are being right. sent against your network. Oh, wait, That's people, important, are, people are supposed to detect this stuff? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> even, not, even, even when we're going in all hot and heavy. Yes. Yeah. At what point are you detecting them? 
You know, a, a lot of people are supposed to detect us. Yeah, well, a lot of times you'll start a test and say, "Look, you know, you know what? For the first couple of days, we're gonna be we're gonna be stealthy, and I like to increase the level of noise as the pen test goes mm-hmm. and see at what point they actually have detections in place, and kind of use that as a gauge to say, "Well, you know, you really didn't detect us till the end, and that's when we were really noisy. So we need to work on we need to work with you to yeah. come up with some better detection. So you're detecting yeah. this stuff. We got early flare on. guns and symbols going over here, yeah. and, he didn't and, and, and quite honestly, the the flare guns and the symbols I, I've, that I've seen, depending on the customer, um, the flare guns and symbols don't even work because they have so much else going on in their environment, mm-hmm. um, including saxophones and, yeah. and drum kits and and um, yeah. You know, it's yeah, a herd of elephants. Yeah, no, you're right. A fire. Are that, it that, out. They, remember, that they don't detect remember. us until we reboot their domain controller type of thing. I, you know, I, I, well, but I, I, I think mean, it's one of the top problems that we have today is being able to cut through that noise, look at your indicators mm. of compromise, and find those detections. And the technology yeah. that you use to yeah. do that is, I don't know. I, and it, I, and it, I, and I don't want to throw it's stones, not, And it's not even so much necessarily being cutting through the noise, but think about some of the other day-to-day tasks that all these security analysts have to do mm-hmm. that just don't allow them to even look at the noise, yeah. even though they're required to look at all these logs that they just, oh yeah, we've got this alert. I can't look at that right now because I have to go to this meeting and I have to kick off this new project because we have this huge new massive initiative that we have. And to I do. have to do X, Y, Z for compliance. And the, the thing that gets me is mm. I want to talk about the SIM space that I think certain analyst firms maybe you give the G, have lumped those <laughs> into one big gigantic category and they call it SIM. Mm. When really, they begin, begin with a G and sound like Shartner? Yeah. Okay. But the, really, there's there's three, maybe four different subcategories to that that people I are know. using. So I, I get my big SIM vendor and I collect all my logs with it. You know why? Because I have to Compliance tells me, audit tells me, I got to store my logs for a year. So that's what I'm going to use to do that. But you know what? I'm a security analyst. I got to be able to detect attacks. So I'm going to go use some other products to do threat analytics. I'm going to use some mm-hmm. other products to, to see my indicators of compromise. So I'm looking at Splunk. I'm looking at Logarithm. I'm looking at all these other products. Yep. Um, they give me different levels of detection beyond all of that. And I, I that's one of the I mean, I, I talked to yeah, a lot but, of different but companies. Keep in mind this is too. one of the challenges that we have today is what what are these tools doing for us? How do they fit? And it, yeah, you can't just lump it all in one big thing. you got to break it out. D- yeah. Take that a step further, though, too. When are we saying, hey, is this tool decreasing my workload or increasing my mm-hmm. workload, mm-hmm. right? Because, you know, Larry, what you brought up, too, and we, we'll talk about this in, in, in the leadership series. There's a whole – you need to prioritize. You have a limited amount of energy and effort. By the way, probably in terms of which activities you can do during the day. But, it, you know, I've talked to a lot of companies that have automated their detection, but they're manually sifting through – hundreds of tickets at an 80 to 90 percent false positive rate you know what that tells us they didn't get the right tools they didn't tune the tools they've created an automated pile of mess that they've got to work through so then when we say well yeah they were buried in the noise of course they were but how much of that is self-inflicted and as i always like to say it's bad to shoot yourself in the foot but it's worse to reload Mm -hmm. and we got to break that cycle yeah, it, yep. it's interesting. Uh, Pony Express came up in those conversations as well because if, you know, and I, I think it comes to Michael's point of you determine, almost you got to determine what noise you want to deal with. And if you're, let's say you're a big retail chain and you've got lots of stores out there that's and they all have wireless. That's a lot of noise. Yeah, that, that's a lot of noise, but it's also a huge attack vector. Yep. And where do you yeah. focus your efforts, right? And it depends on the organization. And a lot of organizations will come to me and say, well, what's the best practice? And I'm like, it's what you make of it, right? It's not, don't worry about what a third party organization is saying you should do. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about what other yes. people in your industry are doing. What, you what are look, you going to do? Take a look at both of those and find out what works for you. Take a look at yourself, take a look yep. at your business, become a leader, and define what it is for you that, that you want to do. And, Mike, I took a page from your book on that, and I think my recommendations now are much clearer when, when, when people kind of have those recommendations. And I'm giving you jazz hands for that. I don't want to trigger any anxiety, but <laughs> yeah, yes, you know, yes. wow. Yes. yes. It's come full circle. Come full circle now. <laughs> no, but I mean, look, I, 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 it always upsets me when I hear people look at stuff and they go, well, just tell us the answer. Mm. And you guys just said, look, I, Larry, you're right. Go look at what other people are doing, but then ask them why they're doing it and then ask them, 
it, you know, is it working for you? And of course they're going to say, yeah, it's working great. Say, cool. So how much workload did it reduce? How many, you know, what did, how did it help? And when they can't answer that question, go, cool, thanks, man. All right, we'll keep up the good work. And then in yourself go, that's probably not going to work for us. Well, <laughs> if, if you're putting a tool in that's not increasing your capabilities or decreasing your workload, you've, you've reloaded, you know, and, and you're shooting at your feet or worse. Yeah, and that's not to say that you can't take components from what other people are doing, components from what, you know, third parties are saying and say, you know, hey, that component, that's a really good idea. I think we could apply this yeah. and work it into our process this way. That's a great way to use that. But you can't just take it at face value and be like, yeah, I just want someone to tell me what to yeah. do. I mean, you've got to know. You need to You do have it to yourself. understand why oh. that component's in place for them. Yeah. You know, What's what it doing for you? Yeah. In addition to, you know, whether or not it had any impact for them, good or bad, as far as workload, why did they put it in place? Mm. Why did they make that choice? What were they trying to solve with it? Because if that, that doesn't apply to your situation, then you putting it in place is going to be a big waste of time, mm -hmm. money, effort, yep, everything. And you're going to create a lot of friction, and, and that's going to create a lot more problems. But sometimes creating friction is good. There are times friction is awesome. <laughs> Uh, uh, we and try then, to avoid then, that then, here. We have a and, 55 and times drum of lube on the main. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. That reminds me. I got to bring that. That we got. Yes, yeah, we, we got to bring that prop that. in. We need that. We need the props. Yep. Oh boy. Anyway, let's talk about something different. Chris is telling us to wrap, wrap it, up. it up. We don't want to though. Wrap it up. We would be, if we wrapped up, then we would be on time, and we don't want to do that. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> Matt, why don't you tell us about the Nessus roadmap? Can you talk about it at all? Public what can you say publicly? I'm curious now. What can I say publicly about the Nessus roadmap? All the things. We have one. <laughs> we do have one. We do yes. have one. We do have one. That is good. It is a uh, it work living it. document. I was just going to say a work in progress. <laughs> it is. Okay, good, always, good. always changing, always... Uh, being modified according to customer input. Yes. We receive lots of that. We do. We receive an awful lot of that. A lot of it from Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have feature requests, send them to Larry at securityweekly.com. No, there I'm you kidding. go. Larry <laughs> could be the funnel. No, please do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll let Larry filter them first. I've got your inside track. Yes. I'm <laughs> there have been a lot of new versions that have been released, and I think it's important. Uh, I don't stress enough with our, our listeners, I think, how important it is to upgrade. Yep. Uh, for yes. lots of different reasons. Yes, and uh, the other one that I found out too that uh, uh, depending on which system that you put it on, make sure that you include uh, updated versions of your uh, JDK. Yes, uh, to because get PDF that did exactly because that was yeah. one of the things that I was like, where the fuck did it go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sure enough, I picked up on that about a week ago, and I'm like, yep. uh, and it's on the server side, not on the client side. Mm -hmm. like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah, got it. Important <clears throat> to update, and there's more updates coming. I think is all probably we can say mm -hmm. about that, mm -hmm. unless Matt wants to tell us anything else. No, no, <laughs> that, that sounds <laughs> no, about right. That pretty much sums it up. Yeah, no. <laughs> you gotta, I mean, I, I would say that if uh, if you're intrigued by the agents we just released, stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Chris, how's that working out for you? <laughs> yeah, how are those Nessus agents, Chris? <laughs> I put Nessus agents on some of the <laughs> systems here in the studio, and Chris blamed everything on the Nessus <laughs> agent. Dear God. That's exactly what we expected. Yep. Yep. Because it's always the Nessus agent. It's, 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 it's always an agent. Yep. If there's a new agent on the box, that's the, that's the problem. It's all not evil. the agent, it's the network. Or it's those damn or it's security the firewall. guys. It's the security guys. It's damn the firewall. firewall. It's always the firewall. firewall. No. Damn. IP nope. tables dash F. It's my okay, favorite just, command. Just, nope. it, just Never the firewall. UPN Turn off the IPS. Just UPNP. Just do it. Stuff doesn't work. IP tables dash F. So Little did saying. Paul know I said it's a default drop. He created an alias that IP tables dash F just really does nothing. Oh, <laughs> that's a great idea. <laughs> that <is> great. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to log you out, actually. Yeah, that's exactly what it's going to do. <laughs> and, no, it's and, going and to... The website will still be broken. And then so. what? Then what uh, implement fail to ban yes. so that you can't log back in? <laughs> or, or it'll execute Kausei and Fortune. Nice. Oh. Charge right. charge N to yeah, run. never mind. Yeah, echo to echo to charge N. Yeah, echo to charge, uh, charge and echo. Uh, okay, so with that, we're gonna take a short break. Come back and wrap up the show.
<laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening to this edition of Security Weekly. We had an epic four-segment show. Thanks for hanging in with us. It was good. We got everything in. We talked about our webcast, all of our sponsors. We did the Rob Shane came on, talked about Source and some training yep. items. Uh, Steve Crocker, awesome interview. Oh we got like, yeah. the RFC whole, one. Can't the beat whole it. history of the internet. I think in that, <laughs> well, at least a good portion of it in that in that interview. That was fun. Yeah, I, I tweeted that the, and said to you that that was like listening to my grandpa tell war stories, and it was <laughs> <Yes>. totally awesome. <laughs> it was. It was awesome. It's awesome. So uh, thanks. We everyone. mailed our RFCs around, <laughs> and we liked it. Yeah, that's right. Get off my lawn. <laughs> 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 that was totally awesome. So, Larry, and uh, take us out. Uh, over and RFC one. Mm, barbecue. I don't think there's enough pink on.